on the windowsill are the new, there's, there's the old guy is standing up on the right. That's the one we're using now. But there's another stack that is for the fall quarter, and they have sent those already. And so it should be, it's a Ezekiel and Daniel on it. That green one might be Revelation, I don't know. <clears throat> but the other ones are, are new for the next quarter, and so, again, they send them early. Yeah. So yeah. Them out. Yeah. Uh, the Bible. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, again, last week, for those of you who were not here, we skipped our, our normal lesson, which would have been Ezekiel 27, because it had to do with the fall of Tyre, and that's all very appropriate. But what I thought was more important was Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 is a lamentation for the king of Tyre, but it obviously morphs from a human being to a extraterrestrial spiritual force who I believe is actually Satan. And we compared it to Isaiah chapter 14. It's very easy to remember. Isaiah 14 is equal to 28. 2 times 14 is? 14. <laughs> <laughs> and he taught math, right? <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> new math. I taught you. New math. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's, it's obvious that the beginning and ending of chapter 28 have to do with a physical king. But in the middle... Uh, is a description of a power that is far greater than any human being. It says point blank that he was in, in the Garden of Eden, that he was created perfect. And so uh, many Bible scholars believe that what you have here is that there are certain individuals throughout history who have been maniacal dictators, who go beyond being just evil, who go on beyond being demon-possessed, who possibly being even possessed by Satan himself. And again, when you get to the book of Revelation, where we just were, you have the Antichrist, and he seems to be possessed by Satan. And so, uh, anyway, uh, in, in, uh, in Isaiah 14, it talks about him being called Lucifer, uh, and, and this is the king of Babylon that's described in Isaiah 14. The king of Tyre is described in Ezekiel 28. So again, uh, some of these great world emperors apparently were, were possessed. Anyway, as we get into now chapter 29 through 32, we're going to take a look at the lamentation over Egypt. Now, <clears throat> this is all good news. Because if you read this whole section of the book of Ezekiel, it proves that someday there will be ultimate justice. We look at these, these major world empires, we look at the evil they have done, and we say, did they just get away with it? We take a look at some of these, these kings or emperors or dictators like Hitler, who instead of um, answering the human justice, put a bullet in his brain. And so we say, did he get away with it? Well, when you take a look at this section of scripture, we're going to see no. They did not get away with it. God knows, God hears, God sees, God understands. And ultimately, these major empires and their leaders are going to have to pay someday. They're going to answer to God's justice. And so when we see what is going on in the world today, obviously we see an incredible amount of injustice. Mark and Andy just went to see a film on the uh, sexual in, uh, exploitation of minors around the world. That's horribly, horribly, horribly unjust. Okay. When you see rulers, again, I don't mean to get into politics, but like Vladimir Putin, who is doing evil things, you say, are they just getting away with this? Well, the answer is no. God's justice will come someday, and that's what this is being talked about. So if we could, first of all, uh, on page 47 of your study guide, there is an in brief section, which is Ezekiel 29 through 31 in brief. <clears throat> could somebody uh, read that? Well, I drink out of this bottle that says world's best grandma. <coughs> Okay. Where'd you steal that from? World's <laughs> best. <laughs> so just used to be here. He beat me to the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say he bought it for himself. Could somebody read that in brief section for us? 
Ezekiel 29 through 32 contains seven prophecy visions regarding God's judgment of Egypt. The first vision took place just six months before Jerusalem fell. Some 15 years before Egypt was invaded by Nebuchadnezzar. In this, in this vision, Ezekiel <clears throat> indicated that the time of Egypt's captivity and desolation would be 40 years. That was approximately the length of time between Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of Egypt and the rise of Persia. The second vision is dated around 16 years after the fall of Jerusalem. Ezekiel pointed out in this vision that Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Tyre was rewarded with very few spoils. But when Babylon got through with Egypt, it would be left with nothing. There would not even be an Egyptian prince in the land to rule over the ruin. The third prophecy against Egypt, found in Ezekiel 31-19, through 19, is undated. It emphasized the destruction of Egypt and its allies by the Babylonian army. Ezekiel's date for the fourth vision placed it three months before the fall of Jerusalem. The statement, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh's king of Egypt, probably refers to the defeat of the Egyptian army. The fifth prophecy is an allegorical representation of Pharaoh's fall. It was given to Ezekiel just one month before Jerusalem's destruction. Here, the prophet used Assyria as an object lesson to Egypt. Once powerful and consumed with pride over its own greatness, Assyria had fallen to Babylon like Assyria. Egypt, too, would have its pride stripped away. So many of you have heard of Egyptology. Uh, you have these archaeologists who uh, are experts on Egypt. Uh, you've seen the pyramids, the Sphinx, King Tut's tomb, and the supposed curse that goes with it. Uh, museums around the world have many of these artifacts that they have taken out of these tombs. Egypt was a fantastic place, was highly developed. In fact, they're still trying to figure out how they built some of the things uh, that they built without modern uh, techniques. We know that uh, Israel, actually, it, you, you might say it was Jacob, his name was changed to Israel, and his 12 sons end up there for 400 years, mistreated horribly, and God has to uh, release them. By the way, if you did today's Bible reading, and if you did your reading in Psalm 105, what does it describe? The ten plagues. The ten plagues, exactly. Uh, that, that God used to deliver um, uh, Israel out of Egypt. <clears throat> but then, even after they were free from Egypt, Egypt represented the world. It represented power. It represented technology. And the temptation, when threatened by these other countries, was to run to Egypt for help. Okay. And uh, on our map, if you take a look at the map over there, uh, in the lower right-hand corner is Egypt. Egypt is actually part of Africa. Did you realize that? Mm -hmm. It's not a part of Asia. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. actually a part of Africa. And, of course, uh, it, you have the whole Nile River Delta and, and all of the, the food that came out of it. Uh, so, I mean, Egypt was extremely important in the ancient world. <clears throat> There's no way to minimize that. But now, as God is going to judge Judah, the southern kingdom, and again, remember, we've got to put this all in context. This is at the time of the fall of the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom has already fallen. Now God is judging the southern kingdom. So if you did your reading this last week, you read about King Josiah, <clears throat> and his revival, but then his son takes over and everything falls apart again, and God says, all right, this is it. I'm going to judge. Well, this is the period of time. Okay, You have Ezekiel, who's now in Babylon as a captive, and God is explaining why he's doing all these things. But his judgment is not only going to be against Judah. It's going to be against Babylon. It's going to be against Assyria. It's going to be against Tyre. It's going to be against Egypt, all of these world powers that surround Israel. Fast forward to today. Israel lives in the most dangerous neighborhood on planet Earth because all of these nations 
that are modern iterations of these ancient empires, guess what? They are against Israel, and they want to destroy Israel, and God is going to deal with them someday as well. So, <clears throat> let's get into chapter 32, and uh, verses 1 through 10, and take a look at God's judgment on Pharaoh. And it came to pass in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You are like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster in the seas, bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet, and fouling their rivers. I will therefore spread my net over you with a company of many people, and they will draw you up in my net. Then I will leave you on the land. I will cast you out on the open fields and cause to settle on you all the birds of the heavens. And with you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your carcass. I will also water the land with the flow of your blood, even to the mountains, and the riverbeds will be full of you. When I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land. I will also trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries which you have not known. Yes, I will make many peoples astonished at you and their kings shall be horribly afraid of you when I brandish my sword before them. And they shall tremble every moment, every man for his own life, in the day of your fall. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> so what is a lament? To be very, very sorrowful about the event. True, but even beyond that, if you've t taken a look at the study guide, it has to do with a funeral dirge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's almost as if these are sad words when someone or something has died. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so exactly. So again, <laughs> God does min not mince any words here uh, about the Pharaoh of Egypt. And again, the Pharaoh represents then all of Egypt because he is their leader. Um, if you go back uh, earlier in history, when Moses was sent to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and just saying, let my people go, uh, what did God do to Pharaoh's heart? Hardened it. He hardened it because it was hard already. And so <clears throat> you see the horrible destruction that came upon them then. You would have thought that they would have learned something. You realize that they had the Hebrew people in their midst for 400 years. They had Joseph, who was greatly used by God. But then again, in the beginning of Exodus, it says there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. So he didn't really know the whole story. And so you have this, this terrible, terrible judgment uh, upon them. You have different things that are supposed to... <coughs> um, to, to, how, uh, to give uh, almost uh, implications of what they are. For instance, if you take a look at your study guide on page 48, it says many slaves taken captive by the Egyptians were horribly mistreated, the Jews among them. Idolatry ran rampant in the land. The Egyptians worshipped the sun and the life-giving Nile River, as well as many animals like the scarab beetle, cow, crocodile, and others. And again, some people believe that what we have described here um, in, in this crocodile is, is, is actually a crocodile in, in this river. 
It says that Ezekiel's sixth of seven prophecies against Egypt was delivered on March the 3rd, 585 B.C. Just two months earlier, the word of Jerusalem's destruction had reached the exiles in Babylon. What is significant about that? These are dates. Oh, these I, are I, real I see what events. You're doing. Yeah. Now, again, Betty asked me how I was doing in my reading in, in First Chronicles. Okay. Forgive me for saying it, but boring. Okay. It is hard to get through the first couple chapters of First Chronicles. I gotta be honest with you, I just kind of skim read them. Okay. But yet it is important for the Jewish people that to realize the very... continuity. Okay. This is like if, if you uh, went in for a birth certificate or you went in for your genealogy of your family, this is their genealogy. This proves who they are. And so it's important that it is recorded. <clears throat> to us, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. There is also, <clears throat> it's a reference, like a reference book, so that when we read about a certain people mm -hmm. later on, we can look back here, these are relative. Exactly. Uh, this is probably the influence they got from these other people and that's perhaps why these happened. Right. But it's very difficult to read. I understand that. But it's important. So what you need to realize is the Bible is not mythology. It's not just some cooked up story. Oh, right. no. Okay. Okay. You have actual people. You have places. Here you have actually have actual dates when Ezekiel is delivering uh, these policies. Okay. Egypt's downfall was so certain that God told Ezekiel to deliver a funeral song, a lament concerning Pharaoh. The prophet had already prepared funeral songs for Judah, Tyre, Tyre's king, and this lament for Pharaoh, Hophra, who was Egypt's king at the time. The monarch was compared to a lion because he was mighty in power among the nations. And again, when it talks about the monster in the seas, many people believe this is the crocodile of the Nile River that <clears throat> terrorized uh, people. I got thinking about something. You know, really, it's probably a miracle that Moses survived when his mother put him in this basket yeah, and put him it. out in the Nile. Would you be a tasty moral, wouldn't he? He would have been, yeah, yeah, for a crocodile. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's another miracle that God provided for him. Ezekiel turned the next extent of Pharaoh's judgment. In the words of a hunt, God told Pharaoh that he would send the Babylonian army to net him, haul him up, and cast him into an open field. There the birds and beasts would gorge themselves on his carcass and the bodies of his slain soldiers. So again, that's difficult for us to read. And again, there are many people who have a difficult time in believing in the God of the Bible because of descriptions like this. Well, if God is a loving God, how could he do this? But again, you realize the indictment that God gives against this people. They've had plenty of opportunities to respond, but they did not. And so they were an evil people. They were oppressing other people. And God's justice is coming someday. And we can be thankful for that. If, if we have to remember, like, if I really love my wife deeply, and I do it. If somebody comes and, and does something bad to her, the intensity of my love makes the evil of what they did worse and worse and worse. So the more I love her, the greater that evil is. So when we think of how much God loves this world, then the evil of sin that transgresses against that his object of love becomes more and more evil. And to us, if we could realize more the love of God, we realize more the, the hatred God has for sin, we ought to be that way. We ought to hate sin with that same intensity. And again, you have the people of Israel that were his chosen people, and these were nations that were against Israel. And so God is defending Israel. But again, there's the whole concept of right and wrong 
uh, again, I listen to some of these Christian apologists who debate atheists, and they, they try to point out to these atheists, they'll ask a question, well, if there's such a good, righteous God, how come there's evil in this world? And their answer was, the only reason that you know there's evil is because you know there's good. How come there is good and evil? If, we're, if we are simply material objects, then how can you differentiate between good and evil? But there's something within us that God has placed in us to realize there's difference. And so again, there are those who say, if God is a loving God, how come he lets all of this go on in the world? This is proof that the day is coming, and it came during Ezekiel's time. Okay, God judged the nations around Israel during that period of time. When we go to the book of Revelation, we see this ultimate judgment that is going to take place. Um, it's interesting that some, if you take a look at page not 49 of your study guide, the lower uh, left-hand area there, it says the language used to describe God's judgment of Pharaoh was perhaps intended to recall the judgments that led up to the exodus of Israel from Egypt. You have the flowing of blood, which is the first plague. You have the blotting out of the heavenly lights. And again, if you read Psalm 105 in your reading, the psalmist here recounts some of the ways that, that God delivered his people. Actually, there's a list of it. And so it could be that this is very similar to that. Uh, also, when you take a look at the uh, paragraph on page 49, right-hand column, second down, Ezekiel prophesied that many evil nations would fall. All of them did fall according to God's divine decree. Scripture reveals that even the greatest of earthly rulers, like the ancient pharaohs, are answerable to God. Not even the mightiest armies can withstand his power. And again, just take a look at the last century, Adolf Hitler and his whole movement of trying to dominate the world with his third right. And you see the, the pictures of the final days in Berlin when everything fell apart. It was not pretty, but it did fall apart. And I think one of the main reasons was who specifically did Hitler target? Jews. It's the Jews. He, he wanted to eliminate all Jews, a lot like Haman. And remember what happened to Haman? Bye-bye. Yes, exactly. All right. All right, so let's take a look at Babylon's ruthless invasion. And again, God uses one evil empire to publish, uh, punish another. 11 through 16, please. For thus says the Lord God, The sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you by the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them the most terrible of the nations. I will cause your multitude to fall. They shall plunder the pomp of Egypt, and all its multitude shall be destroyed. Also I will destroy all its animals from beside its great waters. The foot of man shall muddy them no more, nor shall the hooves of animals muddy them. Then I will make their waters clear, and make their rivers run like oil says the Lord God. When I make the land of Egypt desolate, and the country is destitute of all that once filled it, when I strike all who dwell in it, then they shall know that I am the Lord. This is the lamentation with which they shall lament her. The daughters of the nations shall lament her. They shall lament for her for Egypt, and for all her multitude, says the Lord God. So what is interesting is if you've been going through this section of scripture, there is an incur a recurring phrase <clears throat> that happens over and over again. And what is that recurring phrase? That you may know. Yes. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Interestingly enough, uh, Patty uh, pointed out last week in the end of chapter 28 it says then they shall know that I am the Lord their God and this has to do with the restoration of, of Egypt so anyway here is this horrible lament 
Uh, and again, uh, your study guide says that in the previous section, Ezekiel's lament pictured the destruction of Egypt in figurative language. Here the language is plain and unadorned with poetic word pictures. The message from the sovereign Lord was that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, would destroy Egypt. And again, it is not sugar-coated in any way, shape, or form. Over on page 50 of your study guide, <clears throat> there is a box entitled Warning Over Egypt. Could somebody read that for us? Ezekiel spoke of female chanters who would lament over Egypt. Several prophets spoke of professional mourners who were hired to express sorrow during times of death and calamity. These were usually women who had mastered the art of wailing and weeping on command. Mourners often played flutes and beat their breasts as they lamented, with, lamented the departed with a loud, wavering cry. So gentlemen, I hope you realize that women have a, a technique that we fall for all the time. What is that? Crying. Tears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once they start crying, it's all over. Okay. But anyway, these you have professional mourners. And an example of this is in the New Testament uh, when you have the death of Lazarus and you have these professional mourners that have actually come from Jerusalem to Bethany uh, to, to mourn. And so it was a part of their culture of their day. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly enough, and this is what I pointed out before, on the bottom of page 50, it says, such was the case with Pharaoh and the Egyptian people who participated persisted in their idolatry. Even after more than 400 years of association with the captive Israelites and exposure to the power of their God, the Egyptians remained committed to <coughs> worshiping a human king and images of animals. Again, remember what we were, uh, took a look at when we were doing Revelation? You know, the rapture's taking place all hell is broken out on earth, and things are going from bad to worse, and yet the people refuse to repent. Yeah, let the rocks knock me in the head. Exactly. And so um, it just shows the depravity of, of the, the human heart. A question. Mm -hmm. Have any of you ever met an Egyptian? They're around today. Well, you know what is interesting? If you go um, take a look at Egypt, it. is an Arabic country. It is. Yeah, Egypt is an Arabic country. But when you take a look at um, there are Egypt no Egyptians today, uh, in the last 100 years, they have had to uncover the sands of time. And they have dug up all this stuff that had been buried for centuries. And, uh, and so modern day Egypt is just a shadow of what ancient and what's, Egypt is. And what's the, what's the real name of that country? The United Arab Republic. Oh, okay. the UAE. So interesting. There are no, I'm not sure, there are no Egyptians. Huh. And yeah. Arabs. Interesting. And but the land of Egypt will come into blessing in future day. So that's not Egypt. I don't know, huh. but for sure now Egypt is. We we know that the Arabs are descendants of Ishmael. Well, again, there are <coughs> empires that are clearly described, and these empires seem to be revived at the end of time. Egypt being one of them. But during the millennial period, it does talk about a blessing and it talks about the uh, feast of the tabernacles and how even Egypt will come up for this. So, yeah, it's a very interesting situation here. Yeah, because uh, it says, Ezekiel prophesied that Pharaoh's army would be obliterated by the most ruthless of all nations. And again, <clears throat> soon we're going to get into the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel describes Babylon. And again, in this great colossus that is described, who is the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He was perhaps the most powerful ruler that has ever lived in all of human history. And so ruthless.
totally ruthless. Interestingly enough, if you take, go down the paragraph, it says, the prophet used the word hordes 14 times in chapters 30 through 32 to describe the people of Egypt. In this section alone, the word occurs three times. Apparently, the Egyptians took pr some pride in their very large population. That wasn't going to stop anybody. Stop mm -hmm. anything. Right, and so today we fear China because of its hordes, okay? And yet uh, God is still in control. Pharaoh had been accused of churning the water and muddying the streams as he stirred up trouble amongst the nations. But God would put an end uh, to that when he brought destruction upon the land. With Egypt overthrown, the waters of international relations would be settled and the streams would flow smoothly once again. So anyway, you have, again, God being ultimately in control. You have all these different empires that he has let do their thing, but he's ultimately in control. So and again, I think that those of us who live in 2023, um, most of us really weren't old. Some of you were around, but not old enough to remember the 1930s and Hitler and his taking over Europe. There was great fear in the world. Could this man, could this empire be stopped? Mm -hmm. Well, now we look at it as Monday morning quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we just celebrated, or we're supposed to celebrate, June 6th. What is June 6th? D-Day. And we do not understand what those uh, young men went through in the, in the con oh. reconquest of Europe. The, the, it was not a given thing. It was it, This yeah. whole thing could have failed. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that I always tried to emphasize as I was going through that section of history, that when you lived in it, you did not know the outcome. Right. And of course, we're old enough that for sure our parents lived through it. to Egypt's consignment to the pit. And this becomes a major uh, theme, the pit. And that's in verses 17 through 25. It came to pass also in the twelfth year, on the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down to the depths of the earth her and the daughters of the famous nations, with those who go down to the pit. Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down, be placed with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword, drawing her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with those who help him. They have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Assyria is there, and all her company, with their graves all around her, all of them slain, fallen by the sword. Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit, and her company is all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who caused terror in the land of the living. There is Elam, and all her multitude, all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who have gone down uncircumcised, to the lower parts of the earth, who caused their terror in the land of the living. Now they bear their shame with those who go down <coughs> in the pit. They have set her bed in the midst of the slain, with all her multitude, with her graves all around it, all of them uncircumcised, 
slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, yet they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. It was put in the midst of the slain. There are mis- Boy, if you wanted to have a, uh, a spook night <laughs> and scare everybody around a campfire, if you played that, that would be enough to scare everybody. Yeah. So what you have here, um, in the last of seven prophecies against Egypt, uh, Ezekiel omitted the month. Okay, scholars generally assume that the, the month was probably the, uh, the same as the sixth prophecy. Thus, the word of the Lord probably came March the 17th, 585 B.C. So again, this is specific. Absolutely. Absolutely specific. And you can go back into ancient history and study when these events happened. And scripture is recording them. All right. So if the dating was unclear, the content is not. Both Egypt and other mighty nations were consigned to a place. And what is it called? The pit. The pit. And that is very specific. In the Old Testament, the pit was another term for Sheol, or the grave. The place where all souls went immediately following death. And so, this is not a good thing, okay? Okay. This is not a good place to be. And so as, as he's going to go through these empires, these great empires that originally caused fear amongst people on earth, they're now gone and they're dwelling uh, in the pit. Um, the Egyptians considered themselves to be a favored people, but according to Ezekiel, the nation would fall so far that its people would be laid among the uncircumcised. This phrase signified a shameful death of some kind, usually violent death at the hands of one's enemies. In each of the ten times Ezekiel used this phrase in chapter 32, he associated it with those who were killed how? By the sword. By the sword. So in other words, it's not like you have these people dying of old age in their nice, comfortable bed. No, they were going to be judged in a horrible way. Ezekiel maintained that Egypt and its allies would be greeted in Sheol with disdain by the mighty leaders. So again, you've got this idea that God has a special place for these uh, empires and these emperors and they're going to greet them with the same. On page 52, interestingly enough, you have the whole concept of the Egyptian quest for immortality. Did I ever tell you about my ordination supervisor, Jack Trainer, who was the pastor in Lewiston, Idaho? And he had, it was Easter Sunday morning, and the church was packed, and he was excited, and he was preaching about the resurrection. And he yeah. said, the joys of this present world are nothing compared to the joys of immorality. <laughs> I mean immortality. That was my ordination supervisor. <laughs> so you can understand the way I turned out. All right. So would somebody read box 52 on immortality? Despite Egyptian beliefs and elaborate underworlds, Ezekiel claimed that they would accompany their aggressive neighbors to the same realm of the dead. Because of their complex beliefs in the afterlife, the Egyptians became expert embalmers. Pagan nations like Egypt could only grasp after internal life. The Great Pyramids and their mummification of upper-class citizens bear testimony to the Egyptians' preoccupation with immortality <laughs> and the life to come. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Almost. <laughs> See, I, I planted the doubt in your mind. <laughs> well, they were obsessed with the other as well, believe me. But anyway, so yeah, it's, it's downright ironic that of all nations, 
And again, all of their leaders, all their rich people thought that they could guarantee their immortality. And uh, yes, yeah, so you have these tombs that were loaded with all of this stuff, you know, and they were somehow going to go into this afterlife. Well, Ezekiel says, yeah, they're, they're going into an afterlife, but it's not at all what you uh, expect at all. So there are seven nations or groups of the people that were described by Ezekiel as participants in the Sheol Welcoming Committee of Egypt. These included Assyria, Elam, Meshach, and Tubal. Edom, the princes of the north, and the Sidonians would all be there. Ezekiel's description of the seven kingdoms had two key elements in common. The first is that the people of each nation had fallen or were killed by the sword. The second of all the nations, except Edom, were charged with spreading terror during their time in power. So they're getting their comeuppance. You've heard the expression, what goes around, comes around. Well, a day is coming, and they were going to have to answer uh, for this. Um, and again, your, your study guide mentions about the truth that people do indeed reap what they sow. And so there was a period of time when it looked like they were getting away with it. And again, if you go back and study history, study all of these great empires, for a period of time, they were successful. But eventually everything came crashing down in a, in a horrible way. And according to Ezekiel, they all end up where? The pit. Down to the pit. So let's take a look at Pharaoh's place amongst godless dead in verses 26 to 32. Eck and Tubal, and all their multitudes, with all their graves around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they caused their terror in the land of the living. They do not lie with the mighty who are fallen the uncircumcised, who have gone down to hell with their weapons of war. They have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities will be on their bones because of the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yes, you shall be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised, and lie with those slain by the sword. There is Edom, her kings and all her princes, who despite their might are laid beside those slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised and with those who go down to the pit. There are the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Sidonians, have gone down with the slain in shame at the terror which they caused by their might. They lie uncircumcised with those slain by the sword and bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword says the lord god for i have caused my terror in the land of the living and he shall be placed in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword pharaoh and all his multitude says the lord god so first of all exactly who are the edomites here and if you turn to page 54 uh, your study guide, there is a box entitled The Edomites, Israel's Wayward Cousins. Mm -hmm. Edom was a mountainous kingdom east of the Arabia, Araba, in what is now modern Jordan. The Edomites, descendants of Esau, were bitter enemies of Israel. The Israelites were descendants of Esau's twin brother, Jacob, who was later named Israel after his wrestling match with the angel. Genesis 32. In their hatred of the Israelites, the Edomites perpetuated the grudge 
Esau held against Jacob for stealing his birthright. Genesis 27. During the exodus from Egypt, they refused to allow the Israelites to pass through their land. Numbers 20. And were more than willing to lend aid to any of Israel's enemies. Okay, here's something interesting. That meant that they were ultimately children of whom? Abraham. 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 Yes, they were Abraham's descendants, but they were not of the child of, of, of promise. So you have Abraham, who has Isaac, Isaac, who has Esau and Jacob. But God chose Jacob over Esau because he knew his heart. Esau despised his birthright, sold the blessing, all that. And so you have the Edomites versus the Israelites. And uh, ultimately... God is going to judge the Edomites just like the other nations, even though they were the physical seed of Abraham. They were not from the spiritual seed of Abraham. And so that's a very interesting point that we need to remember. Um, there's a lot that you had to have going on in the history of the Middle East. It goes all the way back to Abraham. And of course, uh, when we were standing on the Mount of Olives looking at Jerusalem, our tour guide gave us basically a 4,000 year history lesson within about a half hour. It was fascinating. But again, you need to realize that the modern conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis in the Middle East goes all the way back to Ishmael and Isaac. Well, here you have a conflict that goes all the way back to Esau and Jacob. And uh, God ultimately is going to um, resolve the situation. So, um, your study guide says, the divine power that absolutely ensured the judgment of these evil nations is the same power that absolutely guarantees fulfillment of all the promises God makes to those who commit their lives to him. So it's like two sides of the same coin. Okay, On one hand, God is a loving, gracious God. On the other hand, he is the judge of the universe. And in this section, you see the judgment of God upon evil. But the other side of the coin is his righteousness, his love, and again, justice. And so, you know, we can, again, take a look at these prophecies and realize that they have come true. And so these other promises are, are, are also true uh, as well. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out was that in verses 31 and 32, you have in Egyptology this idea that these pharaohs were godlike creatures and they were buried in these ornate tombs with all of these riches. They were embalmed and turned into mummies and all of this. Well, yeah, their bodies may have been lying in a beautiful tomb, but where did their spirits go? Mm -hmm. To Sheol. And they were no better off there than any of the rest. In fact, their judgment, it sounds like, was probably even greater because of all the evil that they had done during this period of time. In the end, Ezekiel returned to the main subject of this section. Pharaoh, his army, and all the hordes of Egypt would be joined in Sheol by the nations already there. God had used Pharaoh as an instrument of judgment upon other nations, but now the personal wickedness of the Egyptian king himself and of his subjects was the reason that they themselves would go where? Down, Down to, to the, the pit. pit. And so this is again one of the themes of scripture. And so again... We could spend all day talking about um, the Hebrew understanding of the place of the dead. But again, I'm very fortunate, I believe, that we live on this side of the cross and we have our, the New Testament understanding. And I believe to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and to die is gain for the believer. Okay. And uh, we can get into a whole other subject of the intermediate state of the dead before the final judgment. But again, as we took a look in the book uh, of Revelation uh, in chapter uh, 21, the great white throne judgment. 
And again, people are ultimately going to answer because there's going to be books and there's going to be the book. The books are going to record people's needs. They're going to have to stand before God and answer. The book is the Lamb's Book of Life. And again, the reason that they're there is their names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that will be their ultimate judgment. And God is going to prove it to them. Their name's not there. We as believers aren't going to be there. Okay? We will stand someday before the being seat of Christ. But that's a totally different judgment. Anyway, don't let anybody tell you that we cannot believe in the God of the Bible because there is no justice. Okay? Ultimately, there will be justice. There is justice in Ezekiel's day. There is coming justice in the, upon the earth. So, yeah, yeah, it's important to remember that justice is in God's timing, not in mine. <laughs> I struggle with that. I listened to a very interesting discussion on this whole uh, restoration movement and on 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 um, Christian views today of, of justice and there is a movement amongst evangelical Christianity that does not believe in God's justice. It's some sort of human justice where everybody should turn out equal, you know, and uh, it gets into critical race theory and all sorts of other things that are simply not biblical whatsoever. And they're talking about justice, but it's not God's justice. So. In their <clears throat> extreme of their direction that they're going, the murderer and the murderer should be treated the same. That's mm -hmm. what it goes eventually ends up at. And in the city of Portland, Oregon, they have just come out with the report of a new commission as to words that you can use and words that you no longer are allowed to use in official documents. And yeah. if you read this list, it is scary. It really, wow. really is scary. Read the list. <laughs> it's a long list. A long mm -hmm. list. Yeah, it's and it includes nouns and pronouns that we that, use that, yeah. all the time that are just considered to be part of the English language, and they're trying to cancel all of these words. Yeah, this is official from the city of Portland. Wow. All right, we're out of time. We need to get ready for our worship time. <laughs>